Hey, it's Nomado. It's a, uh, it's a good day. Also a good thing I'm not a drummer. How, how are you guys doing? It's almost it. Almost the end of 2020, thank God. So I was getting pretty close to having my kind of four separate Eurorack cases completely filled with modules. Only had maybe two spaces left. As, as good as that would feel to kind of have every system complete, uh, I'm kind of becoming a believer that you're never really finished with Eurorack. If I'm going to keep making these videos for the How I Use It series, or hopefully at some point bringing back those Song from a Skiff videos, then I'm just going to need a little more space to continue to acquire different modules from different companies. So I wanted to kind of bring you guys with me into my garage as I attempt to build my second DIY Eurorack case, a much larger format Eurorack case that hopefully along the process, um, maybe I can give you guys some pointers so that if you attempt to build your own synth case, maybe this can just help make it go a little, a little smoother for you. So, let's do it. So I spent a couple weeks really thinking through what I would want for this case. And first of all, I just mainly wanted it to be like the last large case that I would be building for my own studio. What that meant was just really being patient with each of the steps to make sure that I'm making it turn out as good as I can possibly make it. But then also really building on and learning from the mistakes I made with the first case that I built. If you were to sit down with either my dad or my brother and talk to them about the first Eurorack case that I built, they would tell you that's probably the maddest that they've ever seen me in their lives. Seriously, the case was like this close to just ending up in my neighbor's bonfire pit. But let's, uh, let's start talking through the process and hopefully I will explain some of the mistakes I made, things to watch out for, and give you two extremely important suggestions if you decide you want to take on the task of building your own Eurorack case. In fact, let's get a dollar count going so you can see about how much this process has cost, uh, so you get a good idea of about how much you might spend if you go down the same path. So you need the material that you're gonna build the case out of, which in my case, I decided to go with three quarter inch maple plywood. I bought two eight foot by four foot sheets from the local Home Depot store. Each one costs about $55, bringing us to around 110 bucks. You can build these things out of pretty much whatever material that you want. However, wood is just, uh, it's very accessible and fairly easy to work with, even with minimal power tools. Now it's super important before you begin the building process to have a pretty clear picture as far as how you want the case to be. Me personally, I took a lot of inspiration from the company and website EuroRackModularCases.com. They have a lot of pictures on there of these large form factor Eurorack cases that they design and build. Just beautiful cases. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into this thought process. The design, the ergonomics, do you want to have specific angles to the rail systems? Are you going to build the sides with uh, just like a continuous curve? Do you want specific features on the case such as uh, space on the top for uh, other synthesizers, guitar pedals? Do you want to have a place for LED lights built into it? That would be pretty cool. Are you going to paint the case? Are you going to stain the case? Are you going to vinyl wrap the case? Do you want space in the front for a place to rest your arms? All these different things go into the design process and it's important to kind of understand how you want to build it before you even begin. So to do that, you're going to want to make a sketch of the case. It's not great. It's not great, I know, but make your measurements. So a simple Google search will tell you the length of all the different size rails that they offer for Eurorack. That way you don't need to have the rails in your hand to make all these measurements. Basically, I wanted to double the size of my case, which is currently 126 HP, 15U. I think the largest rails that the Synthrotech at least sells are 168 HP. 
I was gonna put a middle divider in the case so that I could mount 126 HP rails on both sides. So with that, my plan was to strip the rails out of this current case to save myself a little extra cash. And I ended up buying another set of five pairs of these 126 HP rails from Synthrotech, which costs about $190. And that's because it includes the threaded nuts, um, the three millimeter threaded nut strips in the rails. The first time that I built a case, I saved myself a little extra cash by just going with the slide nuts. However, I find that when you're moving modules around in the case, it's, it's so much more convenient just to have the threaded nut strips in there. So, however, my first extremely, extremely important suggestion, and I cannot stress this enough, is to buy the 3U brackets that Synthrotech offers to accompany your rails. These give you two huge benefits when it comes to building your case. One, it completely takes the measuring out of the equation. The rails attach to the sides of these brackets that mount on the inside of your case. And so it puts them at the appropriate distance. Without these, you have to measure it appropriately or, or like what I did with the first case that I built, try to use these like blind panels that you have to distance them appropriately. The problem is that still allows for a, just a little bit of micro adjustment and trying to drill through the sides of the case to get those rails in the right spot. It's just, it, it's way harder than it, than it would sound, in my personal opinion. Now, if you are an expert when it comes to woodworking and measuring just like, like the slightest micro distances, then go ahead, save yourself the cash. But in my opinion, this just makes it so much smoother and so much easier. And on top of that, because of the brackets going on the inside of the case, you can screw them into the insides just with some wood screws that they actually include with them, rather than having to drill through the outsides of the case, potentially leaving like a bolt jutting out from the side. It leads to a much smoother side of the case when all said and done. So for the 10 sets that I purchased so that I could add them to the five sets of rails that I have in this case, um, it costs about an extra $130 to make this, this attempt go much smoother. Don't skimp on these if you've never built a case before. Okay, moving on. How does the old adage go? Measure once, cut tw wait, <laughs> no, measure twice, cut once. And in this case, I would recommend that you measure like four or five times and cut once. If you're not very experienced with woodworking, um, this is where a drawing is gonna be super helpful because when you're plotting out how all of these pieces are gonna come together, so for example, is the front gonna mount on top of the base or are you gonna position it in front of the base? And uh, how does that change the height and length of all these different pieces of wood that you're gonna be joining together? Plan that information out, double check it, which brings us to my second piece of extremely important advice, and that is when in doubt, cut the wood larger than what is necessary. If you cut it too large, you can always use some, some form of a saw to trim it down, or if it's not much larger than you need it to be, then you could sand it down to the appropriate size. But if you cut it too small, then you're, you're basically SOL, and uh, you're gonna have to try again with some more wood. I found this out with the first case that I built. I was trying to fit the five sets of rails into the case and ran out of space towards the top, which basically led to me sledgehammering the top off after I had already finished gluing and screwing, giggity. Just, just overall compromising how everything fit inside the case. So go big or go home. Thank me later. Now I wanted to build this case with as little power tools as necessary, um, <laughs> mainly because I just moved and I, I don't own a ton of them. But uh, I do own a power drill with some uh, drill bits, uh, but I didn't have any kind of a saw or a sander, a power sander, which I would recommend some form of both. Uh, I found a Ryobi sheet sander for about $40, and then I also bought a Ryobi jigsaw for about $45. And then I found a assortment of jigsaw blades 
for about 10 bucks. So in hindsight, I really think that a circular saw is gonna work much better for the majority of these cuts. It's very difficult to make straight cuts with a jigsaw, but I knew that with a bunch of these side pieces that I was gonna be cutting, I was gonna be doing angles and slight curves into the wood, which I think a jigsaw just is a little bit more versatile in that sense to do those cuts. If you do have access to a circular saw or a table saw, obviously utilize that for the majority of this work. All it meant for me was that I was gonna have to cut each of these pieces a little bit larger in preparation to sand them down as straight and as flat as I possibly could. Now, if you choose to do all of this cutting with just a jigsaw, like I did, then get ready to do some sanding, like a lot of sanding. Bottom line here, the more sanding that you can do, the smoother and overall more professional that this case is going to feel. So I started with 60 grit sandpaper, worked up to 120, and then finished the surface off with 240 grit sandpaper. And therefore, I had to purchase a pack of uh, sanding sheets which was about $15. To get the whole case put together, I purchased a box of wood screws as well as some Gorilla wood glue. Um, and using the two in conjunction just gives the case, especially in this large of a size, just a lot more structural integrity. The last few steps for the case were purchasing some wood filler for about $6. Uh, just to fill in some of the imperfections on the plywood as well as some of the divots that I had made from um, putting wood screws into the top of the case. I wanted to fill those and sand those down to make them nice and smooth uh, just with some 120 grit sandpaper. And the very last step that I just completed was emptying a can of Rust-Oleum clear glass, clear coat, clear glass, clear coat. Bit of a tongue twister. Onto the top and the sides of the case to give it a glossier appearance. Now, neither the wood filler or the clear coat is mandatory. However, I'm going to be applying some vinyl wrap to the sides and top of the case. So the clear coat should just kind of help that vinyl wrap adhere a little bit better to the case rather than just the bare wood. And if you've never worked with vinyl wrap before, it's extremely important to get the surfaces as smooth as possible. If you leave the divots in the wood screws or even just the Phillips screw heads, those kind of imperfections in the wood that will be displayed in the vinyl wrap. It'll push in and kind of wrinkle up. It just won't, won't have as smooth of a finished surface when you're done. And that's what the case is at so far, guys. Brings us to a total of about $570 so far. There's more pieces coming, obviously, but when you think about the size of a case like this and compare it to what a lot of the companies will charge for a large form factor Eurorack case, this is an incredibly affordable alternative. Drop me a comment down below with any questions or comments that you may have. I hope you consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, so you can catch the part two where we'll finish up building this case by adding the vinyl wrap, we'll add a leather upholstered armrest in the front, and finally I'll drop power into the case so that we can get all of the modules back up and running and making some music here again shortly. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys there.